talk to the legends of the creative and entertainment industry. 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 We talk to those on the rise. On the rise. On the rise. Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen asks about the highs, the lows, and everything in between. This is Outcast Creative, and this is Industry Interviews. Ah, I do love that intro from uh, Gary Bolter. Thanks very much. So we've got a great uh, interview today. It's not at my usual time. My my interviews are normally in the evening, so um, I'm not going to. I'm not, not expecting as much live interaction because I know most people in my country are currently at work. But nevertheless, it's going to stay up on the channel, so you can come back and watch it um, at any time. I've got a fantastic guest uh, with me today. Uh, Malaysia's hottest film director, I would say, and they've got a burgeoning, growing film industry uh, over there. And this man is determined to produce and direct films of Hollywood quality. With the way Hollywood is these days, I think he should aim higher, personally. Um, so, But it's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce the director of Malbat, Mission Bakara, among other things. He's got 14 uh, directing credits on IMDb. Adrian Tay. Hi, hi, Lance. So, Adrian, I know you're you're going to go to set in about an hour, um, yep. so you're clearly you're clearly working hard already on another movie. Uh, um, this is but yeah, I have to go in there in about one hour, but it's fine. You can ask your questions. No we, worries. We will we will we will race through. Uh, I feel uh, I'm under pressure today, so uh, uh, no, no worries. It's fine. It's fine. So, um, but look, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I'm glad that we were able to connect through my friend Paul Biddis who uh, you worked with on um, Mission Bakara, uh, uh, n- or Backrath, I think you pronounce it. No no doubt you'll probably work with him again because he's fantastic. Yep, yep. He's a very nice guy, a, a, a very nice British guy who always cracks dirty jokes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think he's pretty good. He's pretty good at his job. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you, you now, I mean, you know, you, you've kind of, your career has... Um, I've I've done a lot of research about you. I've watched one of your other films today, which we're also going to talk about. Uh, you know, I, and I, I've been I've been grafting away in this industry for I think about thirty years. You've gone like a rocket, uh, no, and no, the Malaysian no. film industry is also in in the last ten years. It's really grown, hasn't it? it yes, it's, yes, it has. It's kind yeah, of it's been, exploded um, it's a bit. Growing. Yeah, it's been growing. I would say. Um, no, we had we had we had we had film like we have legends, right? We have Tan Sri P. Ramli, who used to be a household name uh, in in early days. So mm-hmm. um, Malaysian industry we have been slow, um, but growing for sure. And then I think we kind of like um, hit the next gear since um, 2018, um, yeah. the year where the, the movie that you watched today, Pascal, uh, it was yeah. released in 2018. And then yeah. that particular year, um, I, I I would say um, it was a gear shifting year for the Malaysian industry. That you know people started flocking into cinemas to support local films. Um, mm-hmm. the, the the level of um, the level of um, receiveness from our local audience uh, was different before uh, 2018. I would say um, it's, it is very obvious um, if you if you uh, take a look at our box office numbers, Malaysian mm-hmm. films box office numbers. Um, since 2018, it went skyrocket high. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's a it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a solid point. It's a valid point because last year, um, one of our local films, not my film, but one of my friends' film. Um, it hit the highest ever grossing film in Malaysia. It beats every Hollywood film that ever uh, ever screened in Malaysia. Wow! Yeah. What, what what was that film called? It's called Mat Right. What? Well, yeah. uh, well, 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 I'll let if your friend wants to come on and talk about it, let him know. But we're, yeah, sure, sure. See, uh, 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 um, he's, he's interested. He can come here and plug. But we'll focus on you for today. But that sounds <laughs> like a film. That sounds like a film I want to watch as well. Okay, yep. so. Um, talking of audiences flocking to see cinemas, I'm interested to know kind of what stuff you saw when you were growing up that shaped you into the filmmaker that you want to be. So I'm just going to ask you a few quick fire questions sure. um, about the kind of things that you've seen. So can you remember the first movie that you ever saw on the big screen? Whew. Um, I guess it probably was Titanic. Okay, yeah, you're that, you're that 90s age. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, if I'm not mistaken, probably Titanic, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I took people to see that for my birthday. So, look, man, there's okay. no sin in that. What was the last film you saw at the cinema? Uh, Goldfinger, 
last week. Uh, uh, it was it was a it was a Hong Kong movie, um, starring Tony Leung and Dilao. If you know them, it's about yeah. it's like Wolf of Wall Street but Asian version. Okay. Yeah. It's funny because when you said Goldfinger, I thought you meant there was a special screening of the James Bond. Uh, no, 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 not that old, not that no, Goldfinger. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good movie. I, yeah, I, yeah, I love The Wolf of Wall Street, so I'd, I'd quite like to see that. So how was it? Was it good? Could be better, but it's not bad. I mean, I enjoy the acting. I enjoy the plot. I think somehow, if I'm not mistaken, it was not told. It, were, it was not clearly stated in the movie whether or not whether it was uh, based on true story or inspired by true story. But right. somehow I had a feeling like probably it was partially true. Yeah, kind of um, these kinds of things often come from a place of truth. Do you yeah. do you own a DVD Blu-ray collection at home? Of course I do. Good, because uh, I think that's yeah. obligatory for most uh, film directors. Yeah. Um, uh, what What's a film that you've always got to watch at least once a year? Like uh, repeatedly watch it every once a year? Not, well, just like you'll probably what like I'll always watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy at least once a year. Uh -huh. You know, that's one of mine. Um, so uh, I probably watch Shawshank Redemption once a year. Okay. Um, a Wonderful Life, you know. Right. Lawrence of Arabia, probably watch Bridge Too Far. Bridge Too Far, I, I always watch once a year without fail. Right. So have, you got, have you got a movie like that that, you, that mm. you, you, you've definitely watched, you know, a dozen times or so? I, I don't remember me having this habit, like keep watching one uh, the movie over and over again, like, probably once a year, but I do like to watch, uh, you know, in Malaysia, we have a lot of um, festive season, like Chinese New Year, Hari Raya, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Right? So we, we have a lot of free time at home during that festive period. So right. um, during Chinese New Year per se, I always watch Stephen Chow's movie. I mean, I'm sure you know who Stephen, you know who Stephen Chow is? Uh, he's one of the, he's, he's one of the icon, most iconic um, filmmaker in Asia. So he always, he always does comedy, action comedy, stuff like that. Mm. Like, it's like growing up, um, uh, it's, if I if if I were to say my habit of watching a film um, a film against movie, it would be Stephen Chow during Chinese New Year. Right. It's something that I always do. And um, but personally, for me, my um, number one director, my um, role model, not role model, but my number one uh, director to me is Christopher Nolan. So I always I always watch his film. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you would have seen Oppenheimer and. Uh... Yeah, I did. Yes. I just wish he would do a film where he tells it in sequence. <laughs> like, I just wish he would do a traditional narrative, tells it in sequence, start to finish. Um, he did, he did. He did it with uh, Interstellar and Inception, I think. It was quite yeah, Interstellar. Well, yeah, Interstellar's yeah, kind of about his time, time yeah. relative and all that. But yeah. all right, let's let's get on to your um career. So uh I mean you've got 14 um directing credits. Uh, start really? starting off with I think it was um was it reclaim in in twenty fourteen no. um, reclaim reclaim um I I think I co-produced that film I co-produced that film yeah um I, it wasn't directed by me um, sorry uh, uh Lilo Popo yeah yes yes that was yeah. my first director debut in two thousand ten uh so and you've done you've done like a few comedies um as well. Yes, I did. Um, I started off my career by um, directing and producing Chinese language film. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I tried a couple of different genres in Chinese movie. Um, like, you know, like you uh, like you mentioned just now. Oh, my God. <laughs> there it is. This Suddenly, is the, I feel a sense this, of stress. Is, like, yeah, oh, yeah, what a is, cover. What a cover. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. So basically, it's not. Um, OK, uh, you know this movie, um, Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah. Yeah, it's something like that. Okay, all right. So this yep. is this is so tell, right? answer to Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah, something like that, similar. Yeah, I can see there's um definitely some karaoke scenes uh, in this um yeah, in this film. The so both what? of them, they are radio announcer, so they do a lot. Oh, of okay, okay, yeah. okay. So yep. just to give me an idea, what kind of uh, budget was this? Was cool. this movie? Um. Well, given the currency rate today, uh, the Malaysian yeah. ringgit against US dollar, I would say um, it was probably, I don't know, 300, 250, 280,000 US dollar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I guess what we would call a low budget film. It is. Um, yes. But the number of, it's funny, I don't know if you've noticed this trend, but the medium budget film um, has disappeared. And exactly. everybody. Everybody is making films for under half a million US oh, dollars, or like, or, or 
you know, Multi 400 million yeah. US dollars or 200 million above, um, maybe 100 million. But those kind of 15 to 30 million pound films have disappeared. Yeah. Yep. And directors like you and me could make a 15 million pound movie look like a 500 million pound movie, I bet. Yep. Um, you know, we wouldn't need that kind of money, but most of it goes on producers' fees and things like this. All cuts. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, and then you did The Wedding Diary, Wedding Diary, to, wedding, wedding Diary, wedding diary one, Yep. I, I get, I'm guessing, again, both comedies, kind of four weddings and a funeral, that sort of vibe. Uh, yeah, it's a rom-com, romantic comedy. Yeah. But yeah. your first... So I want to talk about your first um, action movie, which I watched uh, into the... I, I finished watching that last night at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, that's all right. That's my normal, normal sleeping time. So this <laughs> is... Pascal is the equivalent of the Malaysian sort of RSAS... Um, yes. The Malaysian Navy SEALs, I Seal. guess. Yes, it is. Um, that is correct. And the movie opens with a with a, uh, a a true incident, which was about the hijacking of <clears throat> um, this uh, um, freighter. Ship. Yes, yeah, freighter. Yes. And I remember when I was watching it, like because uh, it, it was it was boarded by hijackers. This is a big problem, of course, uh, at the moment. And now we've got drones attacking ships as well. So. The film actually felt very relevant, felt very topical. And and um, your guys go through the ship and they mostly wound the, the the hijackers. They don't kill them. And I was thinking, if this is the SAS, they just would have gone through that ship and killed them all. They, they, they wouldn't have tried yeah. to take any prisoners. But when I read up on the true story, that was what happened. They, they, they wounded most people and they managed to avoid... Um, so you were... Anyway. Clearly, you were determined to depict that incident as it took place rather than over dramatizing it. Yep, yep, yep. So um, basically, the whole movie, Pascal, the movie, um, I, I had the honor to uh, to meet up with the actual hero of the of the of the incidents, and then I kind of like use his life story, um, and then uh, not not only him, but uh, a couple of real incident that you know Malaysian uh, uh, um, royal, sorry, uh, Malaysian Pascal, they have, yeah. they, they have done it in the in in in. Uh, previous mission so i kind of like linked them up three three i think it was if i remember correctly it was two sorry it was two mission that i kind of like draw the dots among them and then try to craft a storyline for the audience to be able to follow and then put it on a character and then the eventual one the the hijack of the oil rig um the, the finale of the movie that was yeah. a fictionalized that was that was a fictionalized mission. yeah i kind of figured that was fictional but yeah um but that's okay um so Pascal, strong heart, never give up, never surrender, the motto of the uh, of the Malaysian unit. So, yep. um, so, so I mean, the story centers around, and I guess halfway through the story, it becomes more fictional, a disillusioned former member of uh, Pascal who's involved in um, killing someone he's taken prisoner in, a, in quite, yep. quite a tense scene. He kind of turns terrorist and you know his own t his own former team has yeah. to um hunt him down now, i have a few questions about how you shot uh some of these things um sure. so uh, and anyone watching if you have a question for adrian please uh drop it in the chat we've got a hello from uh someone in malaysia already there you go oh. and uh, there's several of my regulars uh, are, are in here so good hello. to see you tombi good to see keith thank you for popping in Thank you for popping in background noise. So I wanted to know a couple of things about how this was shot because as a director, I'm always very interested. You had a free fall sequence where people are jumping out the plane. Um, yep. Now, I know you had a, you had a couple of close-ups of some actors and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that might have been green screen unless they yes. wanted to do the, yeah, insurance. Yep. You, you, we, you, uh, no. they're yeah, not gonna let, yeah, they're not going to let them do the jump, even if they want to. And I yes, know and, and, and we, we don't have the budget like Mission Impossible to do the real no. Halo jump, shoot everything live. <laughs> we, yeah, we but, couldn't afford but, that. Yeah. But it did feel like that was mixed in with footage of a real jump. Was that? Um, so how I did it was, um, you know, there were, a couple, there, uh, there were a couple of shots for the sequence, right? So yeah. in terms of white shot, like you actually you actually do see people jumping. Um, yeah. I yeah, that was actually real in camera, but those were being performed by the actual Pascal. Yeah, that's what I I, I mean. I figured you had their yes. cooperation yes. on the it's movie. It's just 
Yep, exactly. Uh, we work very closely with the Royal Malaysian Navy. Like without their support, there's no chance, no yeah. chance at all for me to be able to complete the movie. And um, now about the Halo jump, um, the close up, yes, um, you you were right. We we did it in front of a green screen, and then we rigged my actor, and then you know turn him up, turn him upside down, put a strong fan be beneath him, and then create the wind effect on him. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and something you probably don't know, you know, there's there was there was a shot in the movie where you know uh, the camera followed uh, the the Pascal, and then as the the the, the, the tailgate opens up, and then it yeah. jumps off. Right? And there's one yeah. camera pushing forward, and then. Looking yeah, all yeah, no, I, re I remember that shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I held the camera for that shot. So you did. <laughs> so you did a jump. No, I, I didn't jump. I didn't jump because um, see, we we were on this uh, we were on this uh aircraft. Uh, it was the uh Hercules. So we we won this yeah. the the military aircraft. So um, they 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 kind of like limit us the number of person that you know can actually board the aircraft due to safety reasons this and that. Yeah. And then uh, so after some discussion, my my DP said I like, um, you know, somehow it was me to go up. To, to went up went up to the plane so um they they they, they give me they gave me a harness they gave me a harness to put on and then they rigged me properly and then when the tailgates opened i was like oh it was so cold i was wearing a t-shirt i did not I, I didn't anticipate the coldness so but anyway uh yeah well, it was fun it was fun focusing on the camera like you know almost almost like if some I mean, of course they, they were holding my back and I, but i was just like totally focused on the screen and felt like i was <laughs> falling down <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, I assume you were attached by some kind of um, cable, safety or, uh, yeah, safety harness, and yeah, because yeah, you leaned right out the. Uh, that must have been, yeah, your stomach must have gone there <laughs> through um, your feet. And you honestly, when 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 I was holding a camera at that very moment, I didn't feel anything. I didn't yeah. feel anything when when I was holding a camera, but and afterwards, I was like, wow, what what have I just done? <laughs> what kind of research did you? do um uh, you know uh, for this film i mean in terms of hanging out with the obviously you had their cooperation but in terms of hanging out with the real people did you see them do any training uh did you get to go to their camp and kind of see their life yeah. and stuff so basically um uh, the two the two military movies that i've done pascal and malbat um mm. we work very closely with the malaysian army and malaysian royal navy Right. Yeah. So um, two different sets of casts for, for, for these two different movies. All of them went through trainings, uh, military training. So they went to they went to uh, they went to their, their base, like you know, to train with them, especially Pascal. I think we had we had a longer period uh, for my actors to train for Pascal the movie. And mm -hmm. then uh, because it's a special commando unit, right? So yeah. um, we, we we arranged for them to stay in the camp for I think seven days. So right. they eat, they 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 eat with them, train with them. But of course, the intensity of the training uh, were not as you know as intense as intense as the actual Pascal members training. So anyway, yeah, uh, <clears throat> we experience we get to experience um, their life per se, their daily life per se before mm. we roll the camera. Okay, so so your cast, your core unit of your cast, got to train with the real guys. Yep. Um, yes, how did they find that? Did were, were they all completely up for it, or were, were some of them complaining? Um, um, they survived, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I I don't remember hearing any complaint from them. Uh, in fact, I think they are all very professionals. I think they enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, because it, uh, it's not it's not like an everyday everyday opportunity for you to you know no. be trained with the, uh, special units and then. To, to be in that uniform holding guns, experience like this, it's not easy to come by. I wanted to ask you uh, another question. So when shooting ac action sequences, um, do you prefer to have blank firing weapons on the set or, or CGI effects added afterwards? Uh, definitely blank firing weapons. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I, it felt to me like in this film and in Malbat, it felt like they were most for the most part they were yeah. blank firing um for my but i think for my but we shot everything with the blank firing weapons but in pascal um perhaps this might surprise you we actually shot with real guns and live rounds there are some shots yes yeah i see i mean i saw a couple of shots where i actually saw bullet holes appear in things and i was thinking wow how did yeah. they do that and that was with a, like a real round yeah we, we we shot it with uh real guns and live round Cause you had, yeah, because you had that scene where they're shooting through the wall. 
um, and all the bullets come, uh, coming in through the wall, and um, and then they fire back through the wall. I mean, that looked like they were firing real rounds through the wall when 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 I watched that sequence. Yep. So that was, I mean, that you must have had safety. Uh, you know, I guess you got you had to have a lot of safety in place to to yes, shoot safety, like that. Safety is, the, is 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 paramount. Like it's always safety, safety first on set. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Pascal came out in 2018. Uh, that's available now. Let's let's move on to the film that basically, I guess, uh, put us in touch with each other. Oh, wait, I did have a couple of other questions about Pascal that I missed. I wanted yep. to ask you your your submarine interior and the interior of your rig your rig set, the oil rig. Um, that looked like the inside of a real ship or, or, or the inside of, and I thought it was the, the real inside of a real submarine. Was that, was yes. that true? You're right, Lance. It is true. We went I into the so. sub. Yep. And um, we did the rig. And that, and the device that's, you know, that, that device they had that, that they put on the wall and they scan the room. Oh, you scan like, like the heat detector kind of thing? Yeah. I've never seen ne no, never no, that. Seen that, that Ah, got yeah. you there. It, that's fictional. <laughs> is that, oh, is that fictional? I thought yeah, it had fictional. to be real. Oh my god. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that was fictional. Yeah. It probably, it probably, um, uh, it probably will be real in a couple of couple of years. The memorial probably. wall at the end of the film—that's a real place, right? With the with the names on it, or was that made for the movie? Oh, the ending of Pascal? No, that yeah. was um, no, that was uh, that was made up. That was CG. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. That so that's CG. not a real. That's not a real place. No, that's not. Oh, you place. totally convinced me it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, my CG team did a good job. Yeah, that doesn't look CG at all. Yeah. No, no, that doesn't. I, I, I'm really surprised to learn that actually. That yeah. that, that wow, well, that's amazing. Um, so we're moving on to Malbat. There's a comment from uh, Yi Lum here. The movie ah. Malbat is a source of pride for the country, showcasing the producers, cast, and heroes of the story. I would agree. So here's an interesting thing. I went to see Black Hawk Down for my birthday at the Empire Screen One in Leicester Square. If you've ever been to London, that's where we have our premieres, and it's okay. got four, four big cinemas there. Right. Uh, oh, yeah, so, it, yeah. so this okay. was like 70 mil, you know, THX surround sound. Oh, I, took 20, mil, yeah. I, I took 20 people to see it. Mm. Um, and um, when, when the book came out, uh, I, I read the book and I thought this is going to make a great movie. And then I looked to see if I could write it. And uh, of course it, the rights had already been bought by Jerry Bruckheimer, <laughs> but I knew everything that didn't happen in the movie as well. And the main mention uh, that the forces get coming in is, is the 10th mountain um, and they're coming in. Uh, and I, and I had it in my head that most of those forces were from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, because they were the people that were driving the tanks that then refused to go any further. So for anyone who doesn't know what Malbat's about, we, we, it's about the Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu. And Adrian tells the story very well, I might add, of the Malaysian combat unit that drove the APCs in to get the Americans and pick them up and take them out again. And I think Western knowledge of this incident was best summed up in a comment um, that was posted uh, uh, when I was advertising this interview. Somebody posted underneath it and they said, oh, I thought they just drove in, picked them up and took them out. I didn't realise they had to fight their way in. I thought they thought the only fighting going on was at the crash site. Yeah. No, we, we were not grabbed. We were not like, you know, sorry, we were not like the, the taxis. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and uh, uh, look, it's. Uh, did you take any liberties with the story, or, or is, is did everything happen the way it happens in the movie? Well, um, in terms of mission, what they what what I've um, shown in the movie, uh, it was exactly what happened back in nineteen ninety three. The only liberty that I, the, the only creative license that I took um, was mm. the character uh, called was the, the the character name um, Abdel, the the mm -hmm. Somalian guy. Yeah, because I thought, you know, I, I wanted to make the audience uh, um, see, I don't just want to make an action film. Blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. You know, a lot of action, explosion, gunshot, and then eventually there's no substance to the movie. So, sure. um, you know, we all might claim that, you know, oh, hey, hey, look, Malaysian, we have like one one KIA and then we lost so many assets. And then the American might claim that, you know, hey, we lost so many people, uh, so many soldiers in that mission, right? But eventually, 
Um, who was the biggest loser? Who was the biggest loser of the whole incident? It was the Somalian. You know, yeah. you guys yeah. claim that you guys lost people, you guys lost life, lost assets and everything, but you guys were raging war at my backyard. You know, so yeah, yeah and 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 I think the the best part is no one told, no one like put importance to the Somalian people in this incident, which is why I kind of like took the creative license, the liberty to um put emphasis on one particular um somalian actor uh who is Abdel, uh and then yeah and then through him you know uh, um he can voice out whatever that you know in his mind regarding he was that. the he was the, the the character that was like the interpreter and they end up knocking on his the door of his house yeah. and it was that guy. Yeah. they meet yeah. his mother and yeah the wife the wife the wife the wife, the wife sorry yeah. um yeah. Did, did did i mean did that unit actually hold up in a house that was true yeah see yeah um the what the in terms of incident it exactly that that was exactly what happened like you know there there was this lost platoon and then they were they were being forced to abandon their apcs and then they had yeah. to take refuge in one of the somali house and then waited waited and waited and then eventually get contacted uh no sorry it got discovered by the soma the the, uh, the rebels and then they had to abandon the house again and then they had to fought their way back and then reconnect again with the main convoy so that was actually what happened too just that you know i kind of like um, uh, um, make it more interesting in terms of story wise yeah. to have more arch for the characters. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I was really impressed with the movie. Paul did a post about it, um, on, on his Twitter feed, which is how I got to hear about it. Okay, and um, I, I mean, I'm a big military history guy, so I've got some, I've got tanks and things in the cabinet below the Thunderbirds vehicles <laughs> over there, but um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I, as soon as I heard, oh, it's, you know, I didn't know what it was about, but I thought uh, Bakra, that name sounds familiar. Isn't that the name of the market in uh, yeah, uh, in Mogadishu? And then, oh, okay, it's about that. Um, I, I found the whole thing fascinating because we we did we haven't had this perspective before, and uh, yeah. that, for me, that that that's what made the film. Um, really special this is one of your lead actors uh yep. who did a fantastic job in fact one of your cast from pascal is also in this movie uh there are a couple there are a couple cast from pascal uh who are also in this movie hareel hareel azim i think Azim. yeah Hariel Azim. The, lead, the lead guy from pascal yes yeah he's a good actor i i, I liked him unfortunately so, he, he he has retired he's retired Yes, uh, because he suffered from an, a knee injury. Then, you know, I hope he comes back again. But for now, he he has publicly announced that he's he's retiring from the industry. Oh, yeah. Oh, he could play roles in wheelchairs, couldn't he? Or <laughs> um, well, so I want to ask you some practical stuff about shooting this movie. I mean, because sure. this, this is a big film, you know. I'm oh, sorry, that's Pascal. So huge action sequences. Oh, you know, obviously there's some CGI um, here and there. Uh, I thought the CGI was perfectly fine. I, you know, I, I hate it when I'm watching a movie and I go, oh, that CGI is really bad. But all of this felt fine. Um, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that because I did. we did have some, uh, we did receive some comments about the CG, like, you know, but it's never enough. It's ne it, it will never be enough for... I think, I yeah. think... You know, I mean, maybe maybe the shot of the helicopter going past with the smoke coming out of it could have been a bit better. Or, or um, but look, you've got the budget. I'm a director, so you never have enough money. You never have enough time. Exactly. Um, you, you know, so you have to balance everything and produce the best film that you can. The the and budget on this movie was what? Uh wait, hang on. It's, it was about. I was less than slightly less than five mil. Right, so yeah. let's say five million dollars. This looks like a fifty million dollar film. Oh, thank you very much. It doesn't much. look like a five million dollar film to me, anyway. Um, and I'm a quite a critical guy. So, um, uh, so how many of the APCs did you have? Because I guessed you only had two. But no, um, see, we, we we shot the movie at Turkey, so um, the yeah. the. The most, uh, the biggest problem for us to shoot in Turkey is that how did we get the military asset from Malaysia and transport them to Turkey, where I need, where I needed the landscape and then you right. know the, the temperature, the sky and everything that feels right for Mogadishu. 
Yeah. Um, so eventually, we we didn't manage to bring any military assets uh, over. So right. um, that we we kind of like resorted to, a, to to the option of building them uh, at Turkey. So you built them. You didn't borrow them from the military somewhere else. Um, they're a fairly common design, I think. No, um, this particular um, you, uh, this particular um, what you call it, model uh, is Condor APC. Um, I think yeah. it's, a German, it's a German type of APC. Um, they have been they, they are obsolete right now. So there they are a newer version of like I think two versions newer of this uh, Condor APC right now. So um, the the yeah, that's me anyway. <laughs> is that you? Yeah, you, you don't know. You don't know. That's me. Yeah, I like oh. I like like cameo in my movies that you know, yeah. hopefully seen. But yeah, that's me. Uh, mate, I did a cameo in my last. <laughs> film. That's what you do, right? Yeah, what and I, I'm also running around with a gun, and it was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, and after two takes, I was knackered. Yes, because it was yes. really hot, and you know, you think this will be great, and you're running around with all the kit, and it's very for the, heavy. For the first and... two takes, perhaps. For the first two takes, it was fun. Then after that, oh, can somebody else please do it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's, no, I was so engrossed in the story, I I, di I didn't notice you because I was really, really so, into it. So, so if you, if you look at this picture right now, um, we kind of like um, separated uh, because we shot two months in Turkey, like a month plus in Malaysia. So in, right. back in Malaysia, we um, we have all the assets. We 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 managed to borrow all the assets from the army. So the interior of the uh, of the APC, we shot it real. Like we really, we we gone into it. We we gotten like two APCs and then we cut them open and then to place our cameras, plan all our shots. So right. um, which is why the interior looks nice because it yeah. is real. That that is that is like the exact the the, the actual interior of the an, an APC. Right. And for the exterior shot, anything that requires my actors to jump out from the car or any exterior shot of the APC, all uh, were being shot at Turkey. So. You said you had to build the vehicles in yes. Turkey. I mean, how did you build them? You you built them on top of some kind of chassis. Yes, um, you must have had a great great production designer to to knock those out. We um we kind of like three D scanned the actual APC in Malaysia and the black, including the Black Hawk. So mm. uh, it took uh, this this like we had like at least a year of pre production for this movie easily. You know, and then going back and forth, you know, wrecking a couple of times, finding out new locations for the movie, and then um, and then we we kind of like three D scan the APC, the tanks, and the, the no, not the tanks, the APC and the chopper, and then we send it over, send all the details um, um to the production team in Turkey, so they kind of help us to build everything. Right. Was they, it was it a co-production with Turkey? Did you get like a tax break because you were filming such a big chunk of your film there? Yeah. Right? uh i can't i don't think so it, it's, it's not a co-production for sure but of course the turkish company sky films they help us a lot and then uh, you know they really help us to control the budget very well uh and but also where, whereabouts in turkey was the actual set where were you where were you filming was it istanbul or no where no it's, it's way far away from istanbul do you remember last year um mm -hmm. i think probably in october if i'm not mistaken there was a huge earthquake that yep. hit turkey right at the spot Gaziantep. Oh my god! Can you imagine if that had happened when you were filming there? You know, like it shocked everybody here in Malaysia, especially the crews and cast and crews. But we were looking at the photos from the internet. We were like, "Hey, this was the this this was where we shot." You know, all the buildings were collapsed. You know, and then there was there was this um two thousand two hundred years old castle on the hilltop. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. Like literally, oh. the only the only oh. tourist uh, attraction there at that city is gone. So we all you know it, it shocked us like really really and also. In a way, we we felt very thankful that you know we already you know we already back in Malaysia. Yeah. yeah. How many how many shooting days did you have in total? You know, you've got A shoot Turkey, B shoot Malaysia. But what was the total number of shooting days you had? Sixty plus, I would say. Right, and how many of those were in Turkey? Um, seventy percent. Seventy percent. Okay, yeah. so probably about. 40 45 days in turkey and then sort of 15 15 days mostly doing interiors of the vehicles and the home the family life sort yes. of home stuff yep um that was very minimal yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what were, what were the challenges of um shooting in turkey i mean you you presumably you wanted that kind of warm hot weather because you wanted your actors to sweat you wanted it to feel like africa right 
Uh, yes. Um, the reason why I chose Turkey um, was because I, I actually went to um, Morocco as well. Um, the place where Ridley Scott uh, shot Black Hawk Down. And yeah. Then, uh, yeah. But um, for the budget concern and then um, in terms of um, the uh, feasibility of shooting at Morocco and Turkey, eventually we chose Turkey. And yeah, it was a tough decision. But then uh, because, you know, Turkey, uh, Gaziantep, Adana, they have the right uh, color temperature. They right. They have the right terrain. They have the right sky. Mm. So this is the this is actually the first day of our shoot, if I remember correctly, uh, which I don't like, <laughs> which I didn't like it because you look right. at the sky, uh, yeah. the clouds, the, the clouds, they were too thick. Like it's the, the reason why I chose that. It's supposed to be a clear blue sky with no clouds at all. Right. Yeah. So I remember uh, I was there for the first day, and then I look at the sky like, hey, where am I? What? Why do I get this kind of sky here? So yeah, I eventually we went back again, like throughout our two months or eight weeks at Turkey. Um, there was a day that we decided to go back to this location, particular location, to reshoot some shots. Right. You know, yeah. I, I lived in Uganda for three months, and you do get days like that. Uh-huh. Uh, really? It's, okay. it's not clear blue sky all the time. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I sure even, that, yeah. I'm sure even in the mog. Uh, but I know if you want to I, – I get where you're coming from. You want to present – a certain aesthetic to your audience exactly you want them to think this is, yeah okay yeah. um so um what was the what would have been the um biggest challenge during the shoot because this was quite a, a, a leap up from pascal i imagine in terms of its complexity and yes scale um to me to date the this remains the most difficult uh, the most difficult um, movie that I ever directed uh, because I direct and I produce myself, right? So Yeah, and you co-wrote the script for this as well. Yes, I, yes, I did. Um, yeah. The thing is, to shoot this movie, the first challenge that I need to overcome is the budget. Like how mm -hmm. the hell can I convince my investors to give me that sort of money making a movie just for Malaysia? Yeah. You know, I would I would presume that um, no one uh, no one else other from Malaysia would be interested in watching this movie because it's kind of like a Malaysian national story, right? So the the first the well, first I, I watched it. You you are a military fan, so it's like you know I mean thank you for watching it, but like I would say like in 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 a general perspective, people outside yeah. of Malaysia would not be that attracted to this story per se. Hence, the commercial value outside of Malaysia wouldn't be great. Sure, sure. Yeah, so for, to be able to, uh, to to convince, actually to convince my investor to give me that sort of money was the first challenge that I had to overcome, you know. And, and you know, uh, like I mentioned just now, um, since 2018, where Malaysian cine local uh, local scene in terms of our local films, mm -hmm. um, you know, we shifted another gear, like people started flocking in to support local movies. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was writing on that. I was writing on the, 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 the wave and the, the trend that, you know, um, local movies are doing great. We are, we are, we are def definitely heading up. That type of um, vibes. This, this had a big cinema release in Malaysia. Um, yes, yes. And this actually, this is also the first IMAX movie from Malaysia. We managed oh. to make it into IMAX version. Yeah. Did you did you shoot with IMAX cameras? No, no, uh, oh. no. We we shot it with the um, Airy uh, Lush format LF. Airy LF. Yeah, I mean, I've seen shots of you, you know, uh, with the cameras, and they they do look like pretty decent pieces of kit. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, um, so okay. So the biggest problem was was getting your investors. I mean, that's that's the biggest hurdle for most filmmakers is finding the money yes. um, from people who aren't going to rip you off. Also, yes. um, how did you convince them to to put put the money in? Uh, I must have got lucky, <laughs> and maybe perhaps you know, um, um, I show I show them my track record. You know, I've done Pascal, and then some yeah. of my. Uh, the movies that I've done. And then ultimately, I believe uh, every investor, all of my investors that came on board for this project, they wanted to tell a true Malaysian story, something sure. that would, they would feel proud by investing in it. So I think that's the, 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 the mood that they were on so that you know, they are willing to give me that sort of money. Um, that actually, if you, if, if you want to talk about the, 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 the problems and, and you know, difficulties that I had shooting this movie, sure, one hour is not enough. Trust me, it would be like maybe... Uh, it will be a whole night chat, but yeah, to make it short, um, to tell to tell the story uh, as close to real uh, as close to uh, the the actual event as possible. That was my first aim, 
and yeah. then um and then with that also just imagine I, we had like 113 soldiers went into the city and then i i can i i had to pick because i, I can't be telling 113 different stories so i have to hand pick like those that i think um uh had more importance in the mission and then single them yeah. out and then make up a storyline and then to write the script following those uh individuals that i picked so that was uh that was another um, challenging part for me Be yeah because I mean, one of the things that was interesting in the film was the, the the combat teams that would normally ride on board the platoon that would go on board the vehicle. Yep. Uh, into any combat, they, they were the Americans insisted their guys were going to be in the vehicles. Yep. As the um, and I mean, <clears throat> a, any military person will tell you that um, the best the the you know if you take a tank into a battle. Uh, the tank is only as good as the infantry platoon that's working alongside it to yes. coordinate the fighting. Exactly. So it's common sense not to take, uh, separate one component from the other and then put men who are not familiar with those individuals. Uh, and I, I, I was glad that you examined that. And, and obviously, yeah. you know, at one point the Americans say, we want it, we want out, we want out. And the driver's like, you're crazy. And they get out, they... Next thing they take three or four wounded, yeah, um, and then they got to get back in again. I mean, that really happened. Uh, um, yes, that was true. Yeah. That was true. Yeah, and then I think the American um, at the beginning, the American actually wanted to take control of the car. Like they, they want, they even wanted to put their own drivers uh, to drive the ABC and so on. Um, and then they, um, based on my based on my interview with some of the veteran soldiers, they, mm. they they told me that you know the Americans actually wanted them to teach them how to drive the ABC, like plug and play type of type of uh, behavior, you know. So then that, that's when that's when uh, you know the the Malbat, the CEO of Malbat said, no, 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 no. Um, you know we have to we have to we have to compromise. No, I can't I can't be giving you my just my APC and then without my men writing it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um, you know, because of movies and um, just kind of westernized perception of things, everybody always assumes, um. American military and British military, we get the best training, the best kit, the best weapons, all of this kind of stuff. That's not actually true. I mean, a lot of our soldiers that went to Afghanistan, um, I remember reading about this in various memoirs of people, had to buy like a lot of their own kit. That's a bit like sending a fireman to a fire without a fire truck. Yes, uh, yes. You, that's true. you know, um, so and, and just because... Uh, a country's got a special forces unit and most people in, in America probably don't even know where Malaysia is, you know, uh, yeah, that's possible. Yeah. They, they assume that your special forces unit isn't, isn't special. Why, why wouldn't it be? Why would, if they've gone through the same sort of training as the SAS or SBS or Navy SEALs, why wouldn't they, they be mm. as good? Yeah. Um, I, I liked, um, uh, yeah, no, I like the, the I like the sense of professionalism that came across um, from the Malbat unit. Um, uh, uh, talk to me about the letters that you put in at the end of the film, uh, and yeah. I thought that was a really good move because the, you were bound to have people coming at you go, in reviews and things going, "Yeah, it didn't happen like this," and you had all that evidence there to yeah. back it up, which I thought yeah. was really good. Um, see that the people that actually um, voice out the most were the veterans who went into the mission, who went, who were who were involved in the mission, went into the city, and then. Um, but somehow they remember the mission uh, differently. Right. Like they were like, they go like, "Hey, this is not this, this is not that. It wasn't like this. It wasn't like that." But you know, I we we kind of like anticipated this. Like we kind of like you know uh, uh, um, expected this would happen because yeah. hey, it's thirty years old. It, it's it's like probably thirty years ago, and then. Um, not everybody's memory served them correctly, right? No. So whenever, whenever we like, you know, when we were doing our research, me and my um, scriptwriters, so we interviewed like I would say I don't know, maybe close to a dozen or probably twenty uh, veterans who were actually involved in the mission, and then even them, even them, like, but during our discussion and interview, they remember things differently. So when that happened, when that happened, when we were at a, a junction where should we turn left or should we turn right? So um, luckily we have this, uh, we have this um, like a logbook from the army. Like mm -hmm. that, you know, really like pen yeah. down every single incident. Like so a radio operator's, um, yeah. I it's it's not like a it's it's not like a, it's not 
it's not that it's not like uh it's not like what you call it um it's not a transcript no but but yeah, i know it's that like, a, sort of, it's like I know the sort of thing you're talking about it's a combat log which is usually re recorded at the headquarters or yes yes yeah. that, that that yeah. type of lock. So yeah. uh, whenever we we whenever we don't know whether we should go here or go there, we always refer back to the book. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, this shot here. So you is that four actual real vehicles? Um, you or can see five here. Six, five, yeah. Are they all real? Uh no. We we only built four. <laughs> yeah. You only you only built four. Yes. And then you CGI'd and. Yes. Okay. So you had yes. four. Okay. So it's funny because when I was watching the movie, I was constantly trying to work out how many you actually had. <laughs> and my guess was that you had two. Um, no, we had four. Yeah, you had four. That's yeah. more toys to to play with, which is um, which is always there. You go. You nearly got your blue sky in 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 that yes. shot. One side is like this. If you look at the back, the, the other the other shot, it was like so cloudy. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, I mean that took. To, if you had to create the four of those from scratch, that that had to have been a big chunk of your budget right there. Yeah. And actually, you know what? The, I was kind of like um, not so um, a bit disappointed with the way they built the APC because they never asked for our advice uh, to which mm. to which chassis they should build the APC on. So they, they chose like a one ton. No, no. Yeah, yeah. They chose like a one ton lorry, uh, the chassis of a one ton lorry, which is not mm. big enough. So, right. yeah. So everything was built based on that, and then I was kind of disappointed that they never cross check with us. But they built it; they already they built the structure around the chassis already, and then they show it to us. Then it was too late for us to change anything because we didn't have the budgets like to scrap it. Okay, and it so it's 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 that that's interesting because uh, somebody commented where I posted um, that they they thought they were inaccurate, and then I read somewhere else that you had two of the real vehicles. So I posted underneath it. No, I think they had two real Condors. I better yeah. go back and correct that. I mean, to, but, to any layman, this looks real, but then to actual military person, you know, they, they could tell the difference. Oh yeah. 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 That this is a very much an ex um military crowd. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, like I'm a I'm a I'm a uh, where, where did mean, you get all these pictures? Uh oh, well, I've got I've got sources, so uh you know like I don't even have all these photos. Where do you have that? Where, where, well, where do you get uh, Je Jesse is very helpful. Ah. Right, right. Okay, okay, cool. And I need yeah. to thank thank her for her constant communication and and we also that's a beautiful shot. I love yeah. that. You yeah. could you could print that out and put, put a frame <laughs> of it in your wall. So yeah. your your actors are very. I would I would say in this movie, and this is one of the things that sold it to me, is is the actors are very emotionally invested in in the film. Did any of them get to meet the the people that they were playing, um, you know, before they shot the movie, or did did they prefer not to do that? Yes, um, we had rather we had a couple of occasions that you know we kind of like linked them up together. But the thing is, um, the 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 name of the roles that they play in the movie is not the actual name. It's not the actual. No, name. yeah, you you yeah. I know you fictionalized the names and done yes. amalgamation. And even the persona, character. even even the persona of that uh, character, uh, I kind of like. Uh, uh, taken the, the 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 creative license to let my actors to uh, craft their own persona for their character. Sure. So it, it's not because to avoid anybody coming at us. Hey, this is not my dad. My dad won't say this. My dad won't do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, that happened. That did happen. Like we received complaints. I even received legal letters, man. I, I received legal letters from one of the veterans saying that, hey, this is this is tarnishing my reputation. I I I would never do this. I never done that. So anyway. Oh, well, was that after the film came out? Yeah, after, like right after the film came out, like within a week, I think. I think, um, well, this is just look, this is coming from a Westerner, so what do I know? But, um, I think it, um, does them credit. Um, I mean, I, I the, the thing that really annoyed me when I was watching the film was when the, um, the, the two big tanks, the Pakistani tanks, which was the best asset that they had to bulldoze yes. into, just stopped. And I did a bit of research on that because I wanted to know if that really happened, and apparently it did. Yep. yep. They, they were taking I, too many RPG hits that they, they yes. bricked themselves. And um, I tried to tell the story as close to uh, the event as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, we haven't got long left, so I'm going to... There's a couple of questions in the chat, so... I, um. 
Uh, Northern English Bustard, not his real name. Who influenced <laughs> you to get into movie making? So I guess when you were younger, you know, who, who were the directors that you, you, you wouldn't have been so much Christopher Nolan back then, maybe James yeah. Cameron? No, not Cameron. James Cameron. You know, the, the funny thing uh, was the movie that actually got me hooked, that got me hooked into movie making was yeah. um, Godzilla, 1998. The 1998 Godzilla? Ronan yeah. No yeah, 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 Roland. I'm a massive fan of Independence Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I it was would... actually that movie that got me hooked into movie, into films. Like I remember sitting right. in the cinema after watching the movie. Like you know, uh, I was checking out the end credit. Like dozens, like hundreds of names rolling up at the end credit. Right. So all my friends left. I was there. I was there sitting alone, like thinking, like, oh, um, you need all these people to make one film, one yeah. movie. And then I was like, okay, how, how, like, how, 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 how did they do it? How did they do this movie, right? Obviously, there's no Godzilla in the world. And how how did they make it so convincing and look so real than to make it in, into a movie, right? So, uh, and then I remember I remember seeing uh, Ronan Emmerich's name uh, as the biggest credit of the movie. Then I thought, hey, this right. guy must be cool. Okay, the director, right? Okay, so this guy is a director. So that's how I got hooked into the whole filmmaking stuff. Did you go to, um, you know, like a, a filmmaking course at college or university or, 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 or did you just bang on someone's door and ask for a job as a runner or how, how did that work? <laughs> no, no I, I, I have a degree. I have a degree in film and broadcasting. Okay. And that was yeah. uh, the University of Malaysia? Or, yes. Or, yes. Right, USM. Okay. Yep. So that Malaysia. was a, what was that? A two or three year course? Three years. Three years and did, it, did, it, did it involve hands-on practical stuff? Like, you know, as- ma- making films as part of the course? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, in fact, I still hope, I still managed to catch the last train of the 16 millimeter Super 16. Wow. You know, to shoot on yeah, Super yeah, 16. Yeah. Uh, my, my that was project. what everyone was using before digital. Yes, it yes. Cheaper. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, I managed to catch the last train of the, 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 the analog uh, era. So I, I managed to shot uh, my project with uh, Super 16 before. So we had to learn how to, you know, the very, the, the, the most, the old way of Cutting the film, put them with together. With Steinbeck, yes, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, mate, yeah. That's, uh, that's that's nuts. Uh, Keith, one of my biggest uh, supporters, got a question for you. What two actors uh, would you like to make a film oh. with if money is no object? First of all, money will always be an object. But anyway, well, <laughs> just for the benefit of this scenario, if you, if you could pick any two actors in the world, let's say outside of Malaysia, because I don't want any of your Malaysian actors to be offended, right? But if you could pick two, two, um, you know, of the big stars, which two would you most like to work with? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> I would say a bit boring, but I would say uh, Brad Pitt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, who doesn't want to work with Brad Pitt, right? That's um, one. That's one. Another one. Um, did you see the film Fury that he was in? Yes, I watched Fury. The second one, I'd probably say Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. Yeah, very cheesy, very mess. Did, very... did, you, did you watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yes, I did. Both they, of were, them... they were so good together. Yes. Yes. And I yes. love that film. Yes. Um, no, they were absolutely fantastic. So what, what are you working on now? Um, you know, uh, I just wrapped a movie, actually. I just wrapped a movie. Um, it's a love story. It's a totally different genre. Because for the past, I would say for the past five years, um, I've been directing or producing uh, mostly action films. Yeah. And then I thought um, it's a time for me to change the scene, the, the, the scene for me. Like, you know, I'm, I'm venturing into new genre right now. So I just wrapped um, a love story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a, yes, it's a completely 180 degree change, right? I know. I get that from the media, local media as well. But it's fun. It's fun. I, I, I see myself as a storyteller. I like telling stories that I like. Yeah, I mean, as a as a writer director myself, I've always found people are trying to pigeonhole you, like, oh, you're this type of director, or yeah. you want to do this no. type of film. Yes, and I want to do absolutely everything. Um, I like writing um outside of my comfort zone. I wrote an African football oh. movie about the Zambian plane crash that, that killed the players going to the World Cup qualifier back in I think it was 1996. Is or that something. a true story? Yeah, yeah, oh. about, about the Zambian copper bullets, and then um, they went to they went to win the African World Cup, 
15 right. years later um because they they were they were the underdogs no one thought they were going to win um right. and it's and the guy who was in charge of the team was the captain of the team that got killed and he was playing for Eindhoven now I'm not a football guy I mean I support Arsenal but I'm not I'm not like a big football guy You're from UK you should you should have football Yeah well uh, I was always oh, yeah. more in, I was always more interested in going to the movies than watching football but Okay. That's that, the human element of that story was what interested me. Right. And um, my ex-partner was uh, Ugandan, and she was the one who told me about it because we were in Africa when the final penalty shootout was played. It's one of the most exciting penalty shootouts in football history. So right. that movie like wrote itself. <clears throat> so I get completely what you're saying that, yeah, you've done some action films, but... Um, you want to change things up. So is La Luna, is that the, the, the one you've just finished shooting? No, um, La Luna, no, the one that I just shot, we just wrapped. Um, I'm, I'm at the post-production of it in the right now. <clears throat> La Luna, uh, La Luna was screened last year in November. Okay. Yeah. I produced it. Exec- it wasn't directed by me. Yeah. you sorry. You were executive producer on yep. that one. So you don't just direct, you produce stuff as well. Is I that, do. is that you kind of, I, I use the phrase sitting on the wall and putting the hand down and helping up other Malaysian filmmakers get their, their projects started. Um, yeah, in a way you can say that because I, I think um, with what I have in or with my experience here in Malaysia, I think um, it's right for me to share or to try to help someone, giving someone a, a helping hand in the industry. So um, yeah. that's why I started working with new directors, you know, um, giving them a chance to direct when I, produ- where I produce. Yep. Which do you prefer doing out of um, writing, directing, or producing? Directing. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's uh, anytime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And no, yeah. I, uh, I'm never happier than when I'm uh, when Being I'm on, on set. A, yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you share the same feeling. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for you in the future, is the goal to end up in Hollywood directing a Marvel film? Please say no. Um, um, or, or is it more to stay at home and help build the Malaysian film industry into its its own uh, thing? If you ask me this question ten years ago, my answer yeah. would be yes. <clears throat> my answer would be yes. I want to uh, I want to play at a bigger playing field. You know, yeah. try something outside of Malaysia. But yeah. um, I know. I, but right now, I just you know, I'm happy. Or I'm I'm happy to be where I am right now, and then uh, to to do what I do. So you know, if, if 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 I can, of course I don't. I won't say no to um, work with foreign countries, uh, production mm. house. You know, other other production outside of Malaysia. But I'm happy with where I'm right now. Why where I am right now, and I'm always you know um, looking forward or try to explore how, what what other things that I can do here in Malaysia. I think the 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 key word is happy. There. Yes, I'm happy. Yes, you're right. And 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 that that happiness in life is is very important and i've had several friends that have gone and worked on big films in in hollywood and almost without exception there's been a couple that have had great experiences but a lot of them absolute nightmare got um, crashed by the experience right yeah and uh, you know gareth edwards on rogue one had a terrible oh. time on on that and uh, it's amazing that the film turned out as as well as it did um because the whole ecosystem is different i guess uh, it, it's well, like you well, there's 20, a lot of pressure. there's 20 people telling you what the film should be. Uh, yes. And that's the, it's not about your vision. It's about one producer trying to make sure they your can make them mark in your, yeah, in your yeah. film. And, and yes. that's not the, you know, we're losing the auteur. We're, lo- we're losing the, the single vision of the creative guy. And th- this, is, exactly. this is how the likes of Spielberg and Lucas and Cameron and Scorsese and Coppola and you know they they were those kinds of filmmakers. I always um, believe that any director should be given a certain sort of authority over the product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what would you say? Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that we've only got a few minutes left. Yep. No what would you What would you say? Um, in your career, has been the biggest challenge for you as a director apart from raising money, which we've already talked about? Um, um, I would say um, the constant need of um, trying new stuff is my biggest challenge. 
And I mean, lucky for me in Malaysia, we are still like we are still at the infant stage per se in terms of film industry in, the, in terms of film industry compared to hollywood and anywhere else in the world mm. so um but i don't want to be seeing keep on doing the same thing over and over again so i would say uh, my biggest challenge would be the constant need of venturing into new stuff new genre new topic new filming techniques you know trying to outbeat myself well i mean look if you ever need a script i wrote 30 in lockdown <laughs> wow i was writing I was writing 22 pages a day. I've wow. got more scripts on my computer than I can ever make as a director in my lifetime. I don't know what to do with them all. Cool, so, cool, um, cool. We should definitely yeah, talk. I, it yeah. was a really, I mean, it was a really good uh, time for me creatively. So I think you're, the, the film you've just finished shooting, yep. is that the one about the, the, badminton, the badminton player? No, no. That one uh, is slated to, to um, we are at the further stage of the post-production right now. It's called Goal. It's oh, a true story yeah. about our Malaysian, uh, one of our Malaysian Paralympian, uh, who is also the first gold medalist in the Paralympic badminton. Um, that is being slated to screen probably Q, end of Q2 this year. So the one that I just wrapped, um, I haven't started editing actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so you, so yeah. the one you just wrapped, you haven't even started editing yet. Yes, and this is, this is um, almost ready. And, and I mean, are you... Are you quite hands-on with the editing process? Are you are you are you there with the editor every day, or do you give notes to an editor and then go away and come back and check? Or? No, no, no. Um, I'm not. I'm not Isud. <laughs> I'm not like I'm, I. I recently read um uh, uh, an interview by uh, the Clint Isud, the way yeah. how he edits movies. No, no. I I'm the I'm the type that sticks to my editor. Oh, so you're there yeah. with him? Yes, yes. Every day. I don't. I yeah. don't just leave notes and go play golf and then come back. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Do you play golf? Uh no, no. I, I, I don't say. I, I can't say I play golf. I'm. You're, you're, I, you're, I, that's because you're too. That's because you're um, too busy uh, editing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I always stick with my editor. All right. Well, uh, yeah. I know you've got to get back on set. So, yep. um, I really want to thank you for uh, coming in and um, talking to me. Uh, I started doing these industry interviews in the summer of. Um, uh 2022 huh? and you are number 50. wow so, so this is the 50th yeah, uh, yeah and i've had people like the first ad from all three back to the future movies on david mcgifford um loads of my favorite actors jason fleming tim thomason and the like paul biddis has been on um i am always interested in promoting the work of uh any creative uh, that I find interesting. Uh, but on top of that, I'm all about promoting the work of independent directors. Um, you know, the people that, that as, as we say, sing for their supper, they don't just get given <laughs> 50 million and off you go from the studio. Uh, yeah. I can, I can tell that you're someone who's worked incredibly hard, um, uh, to get to where you've got to, uh, where you're producing films of good quality that are being uh, put on Netflix, uh, where everyone can can see it. it. How have the viewing figures been for for Malbat on Netflix? Uh, it, it, it is great. Um, I think we've we been giving were... it a really big push over here. You know, sorry, we've been giving it a big push here. Oh. I, I mentioned it on a friend of mine has a YouTube channel with two million subscribers. Wow! And, Thank and you I very was, much. I was a guest on his channel and I right. recommended three movies for people to watch and yours was one of them. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I think probably this is the reason why we were we were at the top 10. Uh, top 10 worldwide most watched movie on Netflix, non-English category. So right. we, we were at the top 10. Yeah. So um, somebody says you should try the superhero genre. No, we've got too many superhero films. <laughs> well, fa Fantasy epic. I'd like to see you direct a fantasy epic. That would be good. Uh, oh. We don't have many directors that can direct it. Malaysia, same goes with film that you do in Malbat. I'm inspired. Yeah, so this man is inspired by... Uh, thank you very much. Jabat must be a Malaysian. Yeah, thank yeah, you very much. absolutely. Well, look, yeah. um, Adrian, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you'll come back again and sure. uh, talk to me. when If you've got another film that's being... Um, pushed out in netflix uk and america and uh so on uh please come and come and talk to me about it i'll always be happy to have you on 
Thank you. And Thank you, Lance. Thank you for having me. No, not at all. Um, so it just remains uh, for me to, uh, apart from saying thank you to the chat for people that have put questions in. Uh, this interview, like all the rest, will, of course, um, stay up on the uh, channel. I've already got another interview on Wednesday with uh, British actor Tim Bentick, who's been in the industry. Oh, I spelled his name time there. Uh, okay. I was typing that in a hurry this morning. Um, uh, he's been in, in the industry for 50 years. Uh, and he's worked with people like uh, Roger Moore. He was in the film North Sea Hijack. Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to be on Wednesday, I think, at my more regular time of 8.30, but I will confirm that uh, tomorrow. And, of course, I've got the Nielsen rating show on tomorrow night, slightly later than planned. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, do tune in uh, for those things. Um, Adrian, thanks very much. Thanks to the people. Good luck to your channel. Good luck to your and, channel, Lance. Oh, I, I really appreciate it. Please spread the word. Uh, if yeah, you could. Cool. If you could do a if you could do a post for me on your social media about the channel, I would really appreciate that. Sure. I mean, uh, of course, people get to watch this recording again, right? Yeah. No. No. Go, it stays on the channel. All all of my fifty interviews are all on there. They're all under industry ah, interviews. Okay. And then okay, I cool. also I also do film reviews. I did a review of Malbat. It's on my channel. Um, cool. And and I do a thing called gut reaction, where as soon as I've watched the movie. I just go live and I talk about it. So you're getting my immediate response yes. uh, to the film. And I, I did that with yours. So the review of Malbat on my channel is like literally 10 minutes after I watched your movie. Um, cool. I'll check it out later. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we're we're going to head off now. Um, but we'll see you all again real soon.